Welcome back. Uh, I'm excited to start off the program, the lymphatic medicine component of the symposium. We have really an all-star cast. First, I'm joined by my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Drew Singal, who uh, you've all heard from already today, and Dr. Tim Padera. He's an associate professor of um, radiation oncologist at Harvard Medical School and a basic researcher in lymphatics. So we're gonna uh, kick off um, our first talk by really a, uh, a legend in vascular medicine. I'm, uh, I'm, I should have said Brett Carroll, I'm the director of vascular medicine here. I've had the opportunity to hear Dr. Steve Dean speak throughout the country, uh, a wide variety of vascular medicine issues. Um, he is the uh, director of vascular medicine program and non-invasive peripheral vascular lab and associate professor of medicine at Ohio State University Wexner uh, Medical Center. And uh, Dr. Dean uh, noted in his profile that he is a expert in enigmatic limb swelling. And I thought that was so perfect for what I've heard Dr. Dean talk about, because he really is the person to go to when you're not sure what's going on. So I'm um, looking forward to his talk. Usually got to be ready to go because he uh, goes very quickly in a, a, really a ton of data and information. So a uh, perfect person to start off our lymphatic medicines talk. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Stephen Dean. I'm a clinical professor of medicine at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. I've been asked to give two talks today. My first one is entitled Physical Examination Findings of Lower Extremity Lymphedema. Lymphedema. Uh, minimally relevant disclosure. We're not going to be talking about therapy. All right, let's begin and review the characteristic clinical features of the legs and the feet in lower extremity lymphedema. All right, here's a clinically classic example of lower extremity lymphedema with obvious leg swelling, but note the loss of contouring of the mid and distal portions of the calf, that normal tapering that one should encounter. So the leg with lymphedema is said to assume an elephantine or stovepipe appearance. Uh, also classic for lymphedema would be marked foot swelling, as seen here. Uh, when it becomes extremely pronounced, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as a buffalo hump. Okay, here are two cases of rather florid lower extremity lymphedema in the setting of primary and secondary lymphedema. Yet they clearly have a discordant amount of foot swelling between these two entities. This is primary lymphedema on the left, secondary lymphedema on the right. What I want you to take away from this is that pronounced dorsal foot swelling is typically, although not invariably, a primary lymphedema phenotype. So here are four cases, highly illustrative cases of primary lymphedema exhibiting rather pronounced dorsal foot swelling. Again, primary lymphedema is typically, although not invariably, associated with marked foot swelling. But I don't want to give you the impression that all cases of primary lymphedema have marked dramatic dorsal foot swelling as seen in the last slide. Uh, here are three limbs with primary lymphedema which exhibit a relatively modest amount of foot swelling. And as opposed to the patient with primary lymphedema, uh, the patient with lower extremity secondary lymphedema typically, although not invariably, uh, displays mild to modest foot swelling. Here are three cases of pelvic lymph node dissection associated secondary lymphedema where one can see a minimal amount of foot swelling. A little bit more impressive swelling in a renal transplant on serolimus, yet still uh, pales in comparison to the primary lymphedema patient. And sometimes you'll erroneously read that foot swelling is required to make a diagnosis of lymphedema. That is clearly not the case, um, as exemplified by uh, two subjects here. We've got a case of ulcerative flebo lymphedema, no significant foot swelling. Here's a case of massive localized lymphedema, no significant foot swelling. They both have lymphedema. And finally, there's always an exception to every rule. Uh, as displayed in this case of foot sparing primary lymphedema. Uh, this happens in about 10% of your cases of primary lymphedema, which just involve proximal lymphatic dysfunction. Rather impressive case. Actually diagnosed in uh, Harvard about 20 years ago. Okay, let's move distally and review the characteristic clinical manifestations of the toes in lymphedema. <laughs> 
All right, we can't talk about toes without mentioning the stimmer sign, and a positive stimmer sign is defined as the inability or failure to pinch or pick up a fold of skin at the base of the second toe. Again, positive in lymphedema as seen here, you can't tint that skin, and negative in lipedema or other diseases where you can easily tint the base of that second toe. Now, a caveat is that a negative stimmer sign does not exclude the diagnosis of lymphedema. Two great examples would be the case of foot sparing lymphedema. Uh, they would be expected to have a negative stimmer sign, yet still have lymphedema. And then finally, the case of early lymphedema where uh, the toe swelling has not been complicated by superimposed fibrosis. You should still be able to tint that toe. So if you encounter a patient with lymphedema that has rather dysmorphic, just bizarre appearing toes and toenails, I would encourage you to think this is likely primary lymphedema. Uh, here's a great example. Uh, what do you see here? These deep, deep, transversely oriented digital skin creases that one sees in primary lymphedema. Also, look at the nails. Uh, very unusual appearance. They're, uh, they're hypoplastic, as you can see, and they're upturned as well. Characteristic phenotypes of the patient with primary lymphedema. And there are even subtypes of primary lymphedema where the toenails are not only hypoplastic and upturned, they have a concavity that looks like a ski jump. Hence, these are referred to as ski jump toenails. All right, let's uh, wrap up and contrast the toe morphology and secondary and primary lymphedema. On the left, we have three cases of flebo lymphedema, only minimal toe swelling and certainly no attendant dysmorphic features. On the right side, I've got three cases of primary lymphedema. Uh, note here the marked toe swelling with uh, squaring and these deep dorsal skin creases, very characteristic of primary lymphedema. Uh, this next case, toes aren't that appreciably swollen, yet note the upturned toenails. And then finally on this case, again, there is a very exaggerated dorsal skin crease. And also noted the, the uh, fusion of the second and third toes proximally. Uh, this uh, webbing or syndactyly, a very underappreciated uh, phenotype, uh, primary uh, lymphedema phenotype. And you may be saying it's a waste of time to discuss such lymphatic minutia, and I would disagree and say it makes one a better clinician to be aware of these distinct manifestations of primary lymphedema. You know, a lot of times you're seeing these patients early on where they have minimal leg swelling. It's unclear if they even have lymphedema, yet identifying these phenotypes can facilitate your diagnosis. So here's a test question to make sure you're awake. Uh, why does advanced lymphedema fail to pit when pressure is applied to the limb? Is it because of excessive fibrosis, excessive fat, excessive fibrosis and fat, or D, none of the above? The correct answer is C, excessive fibrosis and fat. It's not just cutaneous fibrosis that obviates pitting in a lymphedominous limb. Although most are familiar with lymphedema provoking uh, limb swelling as well as susceptibility to infection, often overlooked is the fact that lymphedema provokes local fat deposition. And this fat deposition is recognized in the 2020 consensus document of the ISL when they reference stage 3 lymphedema, also known as elephantiasis. And note that stage 3 lymphedema encompasses lymphostatic elephantiasis and further deposition of fat. It's important you realize fat does not pit, fat does not compress. And here are two highly illustrative examples of the copious fat deposition complicating the case of primary lymphedema on the left and secondary lymphedema from pelvic lymph node dissection on the right. At least 75% of that limb volume is fat. It's not fluid deposition. And lastly, let's review some of the characteristic skin manifestations in the setting of lower extremity lymphedema. Okay, one of the earliest skin changes is going to be xeroderma, also known as xerosis cutis, basically dry skin, uh, typically occurring in the setting of hyperkeratosis or thickened skin. These are hyperkeratotic plaques. Uh, note here this characteristic dimpling of the skin that looks like the peel of an orange. This is the podia orange appearance and is consistent with marked dermal lymphatic hypertension. Here you see a rather impressive array of uh, papules, nodules, papillomas, 
Um, and then finally, if you see a confluence of papules and nodules, uh, basically one bit plaque, this is referred to as cobblestoning. And from a nomenclature standpoint, if you see that patient with confluence of uh, papules, nodules, etc., uh, some of the terms you can use for charting include, these are all synonyms, by the way, lymphostatic varicosis or wart-like excrescences, my favorite, papillomatosis cutis lymphostatica, or elephantiasis nostris varicosis. And the reason these skin changes are significant is because if you're identifying them in the setting of lymphedema, you have defined stage 3 lymphedema or elephantiasis. And here you can visualize what looks like and actually feels like fine sandpaper on the dorsa of the toes. So this is referred to as a fine papillomatosis, and this complicates uh, moderate to advanced stages of lymphedema and is what underlies your positive stimmer sign in a lot of cases. And here are two uh, cases of unusual diffuse confluent pink or reddish discoloration in the setting of lymphedema. And although this is often misdiagnosed as a saolitis, this is actually a pseudocellulitis, if you will, referred to as lymphatic rubor or lymphedema rubra. Now, the pathogenesis of this is unclear, but probably reflects uh, the chronic inflammation within the dermis as well as histamine release. It's important you recognize this and avoid antibiotics. These patients need compression. And if you pay close attention to the dermis of your patient lymphedema, it's not uncommon that you will see these whitish spots uh, that blanch with pressure. Uh, these are referred to as physiologic anemic macules or beer spots. Completely benign, significance unclear, yet not uncommon. Save yourself a derm consult by recognizing them. And in addition to increasing the risk of developing cellulitis, lymphedema increases the risk of developing skin cancers. A very important point, often overlooked. And here are three examples of squamous cell carcinoma arising in the setting of long-standing lymphedema. Uh, this case right here was understandably misdiagnosed as a venous limb ulceration. So bottom line, if you encounter unusual leg ulcerations from a morphological or unusual distribution standpoint in lymphedema, I'd have a low threshold for biopsy. I mean, here's this was occurring along the lateral thigh, unusual distribution. It's not just about infection, susceptibility to cancer. And finally, I implore you to never miss this diagnosis in the setting of lymphedema. If you encounter purplish plaques or nodules or unusual friable ulcerations, uh, low threshold for BOPS, you do not want to miss lymphangiosarcoma, also known as stuart treves syndrome. Uh, the survival rate, uh, five-year survival rate is less than 20% if you fail to diagnose this deadly skin cancer. And uh, that's it. We'll wrap things up. And I'll leave you with this incredible case of primary lymphedema complicated by staggering secondary fat deposition. You might think this patient is morbidly obese, but look at the size of their arms and their trunk. Uh, they are not tremendous secondary fat deposition. Um, uh, thank you. Hello again. For my second talk, I'm going to discuss lipedema evaluation and management. Nothing has changed regarding my disclosure slide. So why discuss lipedema or lipedema? Well, first of all, lipedema is frequently misdiagnosed as a patient simply being fat or obese. Importantly, lipedema is frequently misdiagnosed as lymphedema, not uncommon at all. And I like this adage from Benison et al. Lipedema is not rare, but the diagnosis is rarely made. And lipedema is certainly much more common than you realize. Some estimates are that it's as high as 1 in 10. I think that's a little high, uh, but yet it's certainly more prevalent than realized. So all the way back in uh, 1951 at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Wold and Associates uh, released this seminal article entitled Lipedema of the Legs, a Syndrome Characterized by Fat Legs and Edema. And they identified the following six cardinal features which have stood the test of time almost exclusively seen in females. It's bilateral and symmetrical with sparing of the feet, at least in classic cases, a component of minimal dependent orthostatic pinning edema within the calves and the ankles, hence the term lipe edema. 90% uh, of these patients have pain or tenderness upon pressure, cutaneous hypersensitivity, a tendency toward easy bruising and spontaneous 
ecchymosis. And then finally, unique to the lipidemia patient is persistent enlargement of the extremities after elevation or weight loss, which leads to the adage, you cannot starve lipidema. So there's a unique somatotype to the classic lipidema patient. Specifically, they manifest symmetrical fatty limb swelling with relative sparing of the trunk. There's a discordance between the size of the trunk and the legs, a mismatch, if you will, a truncal lower extremity mismatch. These patients have a pear-shaped somatotype. Again, you can't starve lipedema. This patient had a gastric bypass surgery, lost over 100 pounds, trunk became quite small, legs never changed. All right, so let's compare and contrast the three cardinal differentiating features of classic lymphedema seen on the left versus lipedema seen on the right. First of all, lymphedema can be unilateral or it can be bilateral. Lipedema, by definition, is always bilateral. Lymphedema, even when it's bilateral, tends to be some asymmetry as seen in this photograph, whereas lipedema tends to be relatively symmetric. And then finally, lymphedema typically, although not invariably, is associated with swelling of the feet and the toes. And lipedema is typically, although not invariably, associated with sparing of swelling within the feet and toes. A very characteristic feature of lipedema is the ankle cuff sign, uh, where the symmetrical fatty limb swelling abruptly terminates just above the level of the malleoli, as seen here. Fantastic examples of the ankle cuff sign. And another characteristic hallmark of lipedema due to the associated capillary fragility is a tendency to develop spontaneous easy bruising or hematoma formation. This complicates at least 75% of these patients. You should be aware of the three stages of lipedema. Uh, stage one, obviously the earliest, where the skin is smooth. Stage two, uh, which is referred to as the nodular stage, where the thighs display a cellulite-like appearance, which resembles a mattress or shell of a walnut. And then finally, stage three, the lobular stage. I, I think the appearance is self-explanatory. You should be aware of lipedema phenotypes or characteristic somatotypes. There is a type 1, which is localized to the buttocks and hips, a saddlebag deformity, if you will. Type 2, buttocks to knees, as seen here. Type 3, buttocks to ankles. Type 4, the arms. And type 5, the knees to the ankles, referred to as a cankle somatotype. I'm just going to go through some examples of all of these. So here are two highly illustrative examples of the most common lower extremity phenotype with lipedema, that is the type 3, also known as the full leg type, where the fatty disproportionate swelling extends from the hip down to the level of the ankle, giving rise to the characteristic ankle cuff sign. The second most common lipedema phenotype is the type 2 or upper leg type, where the swelling extends from the hips down to the level of the knees, as seen here. It's been likened to a Jodhpur pant uh, appearance. Here's an example of the type 5 phenotype, or the lower leg type, where the swelling is primarily localized from the knee to the ankle distribution. This is relatively rare compared to the other subtypes, uh, and of course uh, this has been referred to as cankles. Although one tends to focus on the patient's swollen legs, if you do a thorough exam, you'll find that uh, about 80% of patients have concurrent arm swelling, or a type 4 phenotype. And one can have an upper arm or a full arm phenotype. And here are two examples of the upper arm phenotype, with swelling extending from the shoulder to the elbow. And sometimes uh, these are referred to as a bat wing deformity or angel wing deformity. And here are two examples of the type 4 phenotype with full arm involvement, where the swelling extends from the shoulder down to the level of the wrist. And as seen here, the full arm type is associated with a wrist cuff sign. Finally, if you carefully examine the lipidema patient, you'll find that the most common phenotypes and amalgamation of type 3 or full leg type with an ankle cuff sign combined with a type 4 with upper arm involvement in absence of a wrist cuff sign. In the setting of uh, attendant obesity, 
and time. It's certainly not uncommon that a patient with lipedema will ultimately develop secondary lymphedema or lipolymphedema and manifest permanent mild to modest swelling on the dorsa of their feet as seen here. And although this association is grossly underreported in the medical literature, lipedema can exist with secondary chronic venous insufficiency and lymphedema, uh, or what's referred to as lipophlebolymphedema. In fact, in a recently published study from my institution, the Ohio State University, uh, we identified this hybrid of lipedema, chronic venous insufficiency, and lymphedema in 50% of the patients with lipedema that were referred for complex decongestive physiotherapy. And this is a highly illustrative example of an early stage three lipedema patient with obvious stasis hyperpigmentation and very mild foot swelling consistent with lymphedema. So how does one treat lipedema? Well, here are consensus statements 3.3 and 3.4 from the just released Standard of Care for Lipedema United States a document published in Phlebology. 3.3, uh, manual therapies like complex decongestive physiotherapy and sequential pneumatic compression pumps are indicated. Compression garments are indicated. So again, no, say, no great surprise here. Uh, I would add the caveat that due to the associated leg pain and cutaneous hypersensitivity that often plagues the lipedema patient, they might not be able to tolerate high compression. It's not uncommon that only a 15, 20 millimeter stocking is even tolerable. Okay, what about medical therapy for lipedema? Uh, more consensus statements from the uh, United States uh, Standard of Care document. 2.6. Medications that promote weight gain should be avoided and replaced with medications that are weight neutral. Good example of this would be uh, avoid the use of gabapentinoids like gabapentin or pregabalin that are associated with significant weight gain as well as leg swelling. 2.7 thiazolidine dions, such as pioglitazone, increase subcutaneous adipose tissue and should be avoided in lipedema patients. 2.9 sympathomimetic amines that constrict arterioles and lower intracapillary pressure can be considered for treatment of the associated orthostatic edema. Also helpful with weight loss, and they also reduce the considerable brain fog that uh, complicates a lot of lipidema patients. Uh, medications that increase edema should be avoided, like gabapentinoids, like calcium channel blockers, uh, NSAIDs. Metformin should be considered, even in the absence of diabetes, to reduce associated metabolic complications and reduce the associated hypoxic fat inflammation. And then finally, flebotonics like diosmin can be very helpful for treating lipidema tissue as they increase the lymphovenous tone and reduce inflammation. And finally, the last slide, uh, here's consistent statement 4.1. Lipedema reduction surgery is currently the only available technique for removing abnormal lipedema tissue. And it's also the only treatment that slows progression of lipedema. Uh, here's a just published article, 2021 in Phlebology, showing improvements in patients with lipedema after liposuction out to 12 years. And then finally, uh, this is results of an international consensus conference published from Germany, where they have reported long-term benefits for as long as up to eight years after liposuction. And they note also that liposuction is currently the only effective treatment for lipedema. Thanks for your attention. Yes, thank you for your, thank you for your wonderful presentations, Dr. Dean. Um, I have a question. I have a question on lipedema and sort of the, the pathogenesis of it. I'm sort of struck by the foot sparing where I wouldn't expect there to be a lot of just native adipose tissue. So is lipedema primarily a disease of sort of sick fat or is it a lymphatic disease? Uh, it's probably, that's a, oh, here, let me start my video here. Boy, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, there is no definitive answer. I think it's not really, I mean, so that would have been under Dr. Lee. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Can you hear me? No. Yeah, you're good, Dr. Dean. Now we're good. Okay. Thanks. All right. Sorry. There's my time there. Uh, it, it's, it's still to be determined, but I think there are a lot of recent uh, publications that would suggest it's both of the things that you mentioned. For instance, that there, there is sick fat. It's sick inflammatory fat. 
Uh, one of the consensus statements uh, has actually, we recognize it's consensus statement 1.8, 1.8, I believe, that uh, it's a disease, and this has been histologically proven by a 2019 uh, article in obesity where they, they looked at the fat deposition in the thighs and compared it with uh, non obese and obese controls that these patients have uh, what appears to be a microangiopathy of the blood vessels and the lymphatics. And this is early on. So something's going on with the, with the microvasculature uh, and whether or not that's leading to lymphatic leakage, which stimulates the fat deposition, uh, it's unclear. Uh, like I said, it's a, it's a sick fat, if you will, like you'd recognize that uh, there's been abundant uh, macrophages that have been documented in, in several histologic uh, uh, studies. Uh, they have uh, angiogenesis. So um, I, I think, it, was that one of your questions? But clearly there's something uh, abnormal about the fat. And I, I, I just really think there's something to this microangiopathy. And again, there's a good 2019 reference by Al Bagdon, I believe was the, the reference showing this this microangiopathy. And then also, I, I think there's something, uh, one thing I didn't allude to it in my article, but the first consensus statement in the standard of care is that lipedema is a disease of the loose connective tissue. And uh, when you think about it that way, I think it explains a lot of things. And so in other words, loose connective tissue contains fat, but it also contains uh, your extracellular matrix, the fibers of elastin and fiber. And when you have dysfunction of your elastin, you have this over elastic tissue that allows expansion of adipose tissue. Uh, it, it, as you know, elastin supports the structure of the lymphatics, the, the veins, and when they're, when they're dysfunctional, uh, that can lead to macrovascular lymphedema, I think. And there was actually a good, uh, this was a recent uh, lymphocentigraphic study, 2020, where they looked at the lymphocentigraphic findings and curiously, most of them had uh, abundant dilated lymphatics. And I know dilated lymphatics have been, you can find that on an, any lymphocentigraphy study, but that's not the dominant thing you typically see. But yet in this uh, study, 75% of these patients had curiously dilated tortuous lymphatics. So again, suggesting there's, I think there's something going on at a microvascular level and a macrovascular level as well. Steve, thanks for a great talk and thanks for being a great partner with our, uh, our center. We've definitely turned to you and uh, shared cases and learned a lot. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Do you mind commenting on the compression garment strength and wear time, uh, specifically uh, following liposuction for lipedema? Okay, Drew, Drew I'm sorry. What, what was the question about liposuction? I don't, I'm looking on this. What, what would be your recommended uh, compression garment strength and how long a patient should be wearing it following liposuction for lipedema? Uh, that, you know, that's going to be, a, that's individualized enough to your plastic surgeon, but generally it's recommended that you continue compression after uh, liposuction, uh, ideally long-term. But uh, like I had said before, a lot of times these patients, because of their cutaneous hypersensitivity, can't tolerate a lot of pressure. And sometimes you get by with a 15, 20. I will say after liposuction, it's always impressive that this cutaneous hypersensitivity and pain generally improve quite a bit. Uh, it's not just the reduction in volume, but the, the pain, uh, that's very dramatic in a lot of these patients. So uh, it's long-term uh, compression, whatever's tolerated. I, and again, you're, all plastic surgeons are going to give you a different answer on that. I don't know what the right answer is, and we didn't give a definitive answer on that. Great. And then uh, one, one just, just to finish up on that last comment I, I had asked, Dr. Dean, in terms of managing patient expectations, when they come in and have been told they have lymphedema, and then you diagnose with them, with lipedema, if you just give us kind of your 30 seconds on, on how to kind of manage those expectations and, and often the disappointment that patients have. Uh, disappointment, yeah, that's, that's well stated. I, but then again, I think there's uh, some affirmation that they're not just overweight or, or fat, which they've been told all their life when you tell them. They're, they're, again, there's some, some helpful affirmation there to make the correct diagnosis. And then uh, compression is going to help a little bit, but again, the only definitive therapy is going to be liposuction. And that's what you, it, the problem is, 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 as you know, Brett, insurance typically doesn't pay. So it makes it tough to get uh, liposuction approved. And then the other big uh, problem is so many of these patients are obese. I mean, 90% of the patients are typically obese. And until they lose significant weight, understandably, the plastic surgeons don't want to uh, operate on. Uh, so it's tough in a lot of these patients. And in our in our series, the mean BMI was 48 
So this is a, it, it's a big population. It's, it, it's tough, really tough hey, population. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Dean. Thanks for being a trooper through some of the AV difficulties. Always a pleasure to, to hear your talks and get your perspective. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.